Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you all for attending our second event in um, our Conversation with Composers virtual series. As many of you know, we have commissioned more than 50 new compositions in celebration of Eastman's 100th year uh, centennial celebration. And we are just so excited to have with us two of our composers and one of our faculty members with whom um, we're collaborating uh, for just a conversation about the, the process of creating a new piece of music and premiering a new piece of music and what goes mm -hmm. into that. So this, this idea of <clears throat> making new music and creating it, it is so fundamental to what Eastman has been about through its whole history. And so I'm very excited about this. I hope you enjoy this backstage experience um, to give you an, really a unique perspective on the, the artistry that takes place behind the scenes. So I am just so thrilled that tonight we have with us um, a Grammy award-winning jazz pianist and a composer and a, just a remarkable musician, Billy Childs, and also um, former faculty member and P Pulitzer Prize-winning composer, Joseph Schwantner. Um, and they have both written works uh, that will be premiered by the Eastman Percussion Ensemble. And so I'm so thrilled that we have with us um, Professor Michael Burrett um, as well. And so um, welcome gentlemen, it's uh, really great to have you all here. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, it's great to be here. So I, I thought I would start just, um, you know, I'll start with uh, Billy. And um, so you've written a new work for us. I was right. wondering if you could tell us about the piece and sort of help us understand why you've written this piece and the creative process that went into that. Well, um, I got a call, I don't know, a few months ago, maybe, God, nine, six to nine months ago, longer from Michael Burrett, um, asking me to write this piece, uh, write a piece of somewhere around eight to 10 minutes uh, for a percussion ensemble. And I, you know, had never written for a full-fledged percussion ensemble before. I had always written for percussion in the context of symphonic works or, you know, a concert band or, or something like that, but never in and of itself. So I thought it was a really good challenge and a good learning experience. When I, when I wrote music for symph symphony, symphonic situations, um, I would write a short score and then from the short score I would orchestrate the like the winds, the the strings, the brass, the piano and the harp and whatnot. And then always the last consideration was the percussion, you know, and it was always like in an ornamental capacity, um, like after everything had been written. Um, then then I would consider the, the percussion, but I never really fully integrated it into the symphonic world. So I thought this would be a really great way for me to just immerse myself in uh, writing for percussion. And so, but then Michael kind of made it easier for me by saying, um, hey, why don't you also include piano in this in the situation? And I'm a pianist. And so what I did was I, I kind of used the piano at first, I thought I was going to use the piano kind of in an obligato fashion, um, like kind of as glue, a uh, glue to 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 make things sound, you know, kind of connected. But as I started writing, the piano took more of a prominent role, and it's kind of like a piano feature, but the uh, it's it's a duet between the piano pianist and uh, the six other percussionists. Um, so. It's kind of like that. And in terms of like the form, I never really, lately I've been just not even consciously starting out with a form in mind. I'll just write music that kind of makes sense to me, that kind of has a logical continuum that, and it's just kind of a matter of taste. It's almost like if I'm improvising a solo on, on, the, on, on the piano, um, what seems like it should come next um, is what I'll usually do. And this kind of ended up being 
kind of in a weird uh, arch form in the sense that it starts with a certain motif, um, a certain section, and then it goes to another section, and it goes to a slow section, and then it goes to that section before the slow section, it comes immediately as, after, and then, and then the original section is, it ends the, the piece. Um, and I guess the, the main rhythmic clave that I used for the piece was kind of this, um, this, this kind of motif that um, a, a drummer friend of mine, Eric Harlan, told me about, which is a kind of a compositional device in um, Carnatic music, uh, very scratching the surface of it, very elementary rendering of this, this technique where you have a beat, then a rest, then two beats, then a rest, three beats, then a rest, and you do it all the way up to eight, you know. And then if each unit, like rest or beat, is is a sixteenth note. Then you what what happens is you end up with two bars of four four and a bar of three four. Um, so I did that, you know, and then I did the retrograde version of that in um, I think the piano. Um, it starts out with the marimba doing the um, the the pattern, and so that was kind of the main clave, if you will, of the of the piece, you know. And it kind of, I kind of branched off from there and then started adding my own things and it turned into what it is. It's fantastic. It's great to, to get that sense of sort of how you started that and how you structured it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Michael, in the, in the minute, I'm gonna ask you about sort of learning this and the experience for the students. But before that, let me just go to Joseph and ask the same thing about, um, You've written this work fast forward, and right. Right. tell us tell us about that. Well, over the years, I've written a series of concertos. I wrote a piano concerto for Emmanuel X and a guitar concerto for my friend Sharon Isman, and most recently, a violin concerto for Yevgeny Kutek. And um, probably my most frequently performed concerto was a percussion concerto that I wrote for Christopher Lamb, who was the principal percussionist of the New York Philharmonic. Number one, number two, he was also a student of John Beck's at Eastman. And I remember, I remember Chris when he was the, the kind of local hotshot as an undergraduate student. And very quickly after he left Eastman, he ended up with this uh, very prestigious position with the New York Philharmonic, and he's still there today. So I have a series of concertos under my belt. And when I was invited by the school to write this piece, I knew that uh, Michael had to be involved with it uh, very much. I'm a composer that where percussion has long played a very prominent role in my music. And I'll tell you a little bit, a story about how that really happened. As a young composer, I studied the classical guitar and um, rather than play the instrument in the normal way and study in the normal way, I used to have my ear clearly affixed to the body of the instrument while I rehearsed, you know, while I practiced. And if you do that with the, consistently, you get to hear sounds that you wouldn't ordinarily hear on the instrument. It becomes an entire kind of sonic universe that uh, really is quite extraordinary. And for the longest time, I would hear sounds that, again, you would rarely hear unless you were able to be really intimate with the instrument. And this whole notion of the kind of sonic space that the guitar has with its sharp articulations and its wonderful sonorities really became a part of my musical DNA. And the percussion world fits into that uh, very, very clearly. So early on, uh, percussion, even though I'm not a percussionist, uh, percussion became a very, very essential part of my compositional voice. Now, fast forward, uh, uh, again, the title really draws from my early experience when my parents got me a an early tape recorder <laughs> and at the time it was a you know quite a primitive instrument but when you switch to the fast speed you could hear all the music at many times the speed of the original of the original sounds and what that did was give me a perspective of the music at this kind of vastly fast uh, uh, playing but it also brought out kind of textural and rhythmic and, and melodic elements that were not apparent when, when you listen to the music in its original 
original speed. And it gave me a greater insight into the kind of multi-dimensional aspects of music. And I never forgot that. So uh, I thought this would be an appropriate title for a piece that tries to capture that spirit uh, in this piece for Michael. And I've always admired Michael as a composer and, and as a kind of extraordinary uh, solo artist. So when the opportunity came up to write for this uh, centennial piece, I knew that Michael needed to be involved. Really grateful for that. And um, sure. And M Michael, you, as, as Joseph said, you are an accomplished composer. You've written so many pieces for percussion and percussion ensemble, and your students know what it is to uh, learn a new piece and to give a premiere. But what's that experience been with these two really, you know, world renowned esteemed composers? And, and I was going to ask how that's going. I hope it's going really well. because <laughs> Yeah, it'd be bad if I was going to say, you know, things aren't going well right now. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> and the dean's, the dean's nervous, you know. No, no, things are going great. Uh, things are going great. I mean, it, both pieces have been a, a, a great experience. Fantastic, you know. I mean, as as Jamal knows, and I think I might have said this to both of you guys on separate occasions. See, one of the challenges this semester for us, like many places, has been that we started late. You know, we 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 were on co we were on COVID. Yeah, we were because of COVID. We were on Zoom for the first three weeks. You know, so instead of having anything in the month of January, you didn't start rehearsing until February 1st. So it wasn't the end of the world, but it would have been nicer to have a little more, you know, just to get the students to, you know, be able to use the instruments. Because of course, when you're percussionist, you don't, you know, you know, when you're not at Eastman, there's not, a, not much to do for them without the instruments handy. So, but it's gone really well. I mean, they had the, they had the music for uh, Joe's piece before uh, the holidays. Um, and, you know, th but they work super hard. They've really loved the. I think, I think they, first of all, they're super excited about this, you know, that, that both these guys are coming, you know, I mean, how, how cool is that, right? I mean, and they're, they're just excited. Like we've done a lot of premieres, right? Uh, uh, we just did a premiere in the fall that went on my recital by a composer from New Zealand, John Zoth who's written a lot of percussion music, but he's an accomplished guy, you know, and, uh, 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 you know, and we've done some premieres, we've done many premieres over the years, but this is a kind of a special occasion with very prestigious people. And of course, in the celebration of the school, I think they're, they're excited. And I can say from a musical perspective, you know, uh, both pieces are, of course, very unique unto themselves They're not the language of, of, of Billy and, and Joe are, are uh, very different languages. Uh, but in some ways, there's, I don't know, like, uh, there's also commonalities with that, too, I should say. But um, I think with Billy's piece, because we started, you know, it, it was fun to get, I remember uh, one of my former students, uh, David Skidmore, who uh, Billy knows really well, was is a, a member of the Third Coast Percussion Group. All those guys are, uh, those guys are former students of mine. You know, Sean Connors, probably um, Jay Mullen, he was, was here with me, and the other guys were with me when I was at Northwestern. So, we talk a lot back and forth. Actually, Dave just invited me to the Grammys, Billy. He just oh, really? Yeah, and I mean, they got nominated again? To the Grammys in three weeks. I said, well, you know, Dave, I, I really can't just run out to the Grammy, but I wish I could, you know. But, um, but uh, so he's, I said, listen, we got, you know, we get this, we have this, uh, I have this uh, sum of money here that I want to commission someone. I'm looking at these different people and, and uh, your name came up in there. And then as we were ferreting through some names, he said, really, I would probably be a bad call, Billy. Great. So I, you know, it's like, you know, and so uh, I had listened to your records. I had known about Billy for years as a jazz pianist. And, and I, um, so we got hooked up in a call and he was right away, man. First of all, it was just fun talking to Billy. It was like, yeah, this is great. He was great energy and into it. And um, uh, I just love that about it. And uh, so we were off and running and uh, I couldn't be happier with the piece. I mean, it is it's an exciting virtuosic piece for the for the students. They sound they really sound great on it. I have to say they're they're brilliant. Can't wait to hear it. Oh man, you're gonna they're they're yeah. You know, I have some I have some people that can chew on notes on that piece, and they they they're killing it. They really are. I mean, um, and they're loving it, having a good time with it. Um, uh, so I'm conducting it. It's a piece that we decided is, is best right now. With conductor, which is uh, I think it's good, especially I think for the pianist it helps. You know, so. Um, I, I could see it maybe being without conductor, but you know, it works really great that way. The sounds are great. I love the language of the piece. Um, and like I said, it's very virtuosic. Some really, um, yeah, just ripping keyboard stuff going on. And they're, yeah. they're, they're loving it, man. They're just laying into it. And uh, especially the xylophone stuff. I have a really exceptional uh, master student from um, 
Japan. Her name's Kana. You'll meet her. And she kills it. You know, all those, all those nines you wrote, you know, those like, right. she, she does it. She does great. But all the unison, like stuff with stuff. And it just aligns in the music show. But, you know, they're, they're good musicians. They're, they're motivated. They work hard. They know that I, I expect it to be really great, but they're also on board. You know? So they're doing great, great energy in the piece. And I'm, I'm super excited about it. I can't wait for you to hear it. I really can't wait for you to hear it. Yeah. So, uh, let me let me just jump in here. I, I have to say that there's something special about percussionists and their willingness to try almost anything you ask of them. Uh, unlike some musicians, uh, other musicians who maybe have a very specific um, kind of repertoire that limits their ability to go beyond what they would normally uh, understand as being the kind of music they need to learn. Percussionists are very exciting to work with because if you ask them to walk across the room on their hands, they will try it uh, at least <laughs> once uh, and uh, very often succeed in that. And, and the, other, the other part of this is this kind of incredible spectrum of, of sonic delights that percussionists are able to achieve. And again, their willingness to try almost anything that you ask of them. And so that it's very exciting for a composer to be involved with musicians who are open to uh, whatever it is you have to offer them. Yeah, that that was that aspect of it was really um, daunting to me. The um, the variety of sounds that were um, possible is like um, it's almost like going to a supermarket, you know. Exactly. And, exactly and, right. And, and having all of these choices, and you know somebody told you to go get, you know, a, a bag of, you know, <laughs> get some vegetables. And then you look at it, there's all sorts of different brands and, you know, you don't know which one to get, but it was really exciting. I guess that was, I had to get over um, a, a hump. Well, the hump was this commission uh, to, um, to just fully immerse myself in these these sounds, this because the sonic possibilities are really almost endless. You know, you have the percussion instruments, but then you have things you can do to them to to alter the sound and to make it, you know, uh, bigger or smaller, or you know, you know, take an overtone of that sound and or, or whatnot. It's it's really it's really wide ranging. Yeah. Uh, the other thing about percussionists is um, not only their willingness, but in their training with someone like Michael, the ability to improvise. Now, you, the best piccolo player in the world, uh, you ask them to do that, and they simply would they'd stand there and kind of look at you in a strange way. The percussionists <laughs> are ready to try that, and it's part of their, their daily activity as, uh, as young musicians. And, and that aspect of being able to play and create on your feet <laughs> uh, is something very, very special that you would try to engage um, to the extent possible. And there's, there's an extended um, solo section in, in my piece for, um, for Michael that I'm particularly looking forward to seeing what he, he does with the materials that I provided him. <laughs> it's going to be a long condenser. Get ready. I'm going to probably do at least a half hour condenser. <laughs> you know, so, no, no. <laughs> that's the fun part. That's the, that's the, the whole piece is fun. I mean, it's great. I mean, you know, with, with, uh, with Joe's piece, well, with Joe in general, I mean, like, you know, I, I remember, I think I told you the story, Joe, when we were talking once. I remember being, my first two years of undergrad, I started at Ithaca, and I ended up transferring to Eastman later. I think I actually met you, James, yeah. first, because you were studying there. Um, but anyway, so um, I remember sitting on the floor, my teacher at the time, Gordon Stout, who's a tremendous marimba player, percussionist, and, and also a composer. Uh, I was like, you know, I think I was a sophomore. And he it was a student of mine, by the way, at these. Oh, that's right. Of course he was. I forgot that. So you know, Gordon. Right. So Frank Battisti, you know, Frank, who's a famous wind ensemble, con you know, conductor from uh, New England Conservatory, was actually guesting at Ithaca that semester. And he was doing the wind ensemble. So we were going to do And the Mountains Rising Nowhere. So this is 1981, I think. Okay, so, um, and I'm, we get in the floor, I sit in the floor of the Gordon Stout studio, he gives us the parts to In the Mountains Rising Now, and he puts on the Seisman Wind Ensemble, of course, at the time it was vinyl. And I remember sitting there like, uh, first of all, I was like, oh my God, this is the most incredible thing I've ever heard. You know, this piece gives all the singing and the glasses at the beginning and, the, you know, and, and, you know, and the percussion parts were like, I'm thinking, 
oh, can, can we do this? Holy moly. But so I, it goes back to that. I was, you know, always remember learning that piece and playing that with Frank and being like, man, this is the coolest stuff ever. So, and then of course, when I came to Eastman, uh, Joe was here as, as, a, as, a, as a composer and um, I don't remember, did Millennium, I think we premiered Millennium. Did we premiere it here? I remember doing it. No, it was it was done in uh, Illinois, but uh, it was performed. I remember, it, I remember doing that here and some other piece. So I, you know, and I played. I think almost. Well, I haven't played the. I haven't played the uh, the percussion concerto that was written for multiple percussionists. But I played. I've recorded and played the, the original concerto with wind ensemble, and I have played velocities, uh, his solo murmur piece, many many times. And I know I know Joe's work. So um, I was super excited that he was willing to do it and was interested in doing something for me with the percussion ensemble because. We don't have a piece by, by Joseph Schwantner for chamber percussion, and now we do, which is uh, amazing for us as percussionists. But um, I just always related to Joe's music. Um, it always resonated with me, the, the, both, both the color of it, like he's all the colors he's using with the instruments, and but also just the energy. And I, I just feel like there's this visceral center, uh, this rawness that you write into the music, Joe. Um, that I just love because music to me, I don't care what kind of music it has to hit you uh, in a way that you maybe you can't verbalize, you know. But it get it gets in there, and I feel like uh, when I play your music, you know, and I used to play the concerto, but yeah, it just man, there's a part of that that happens that's just you no. Know, so I mean, part part of this, uh, and I think uh, maybe Billy would agree, is you want to write parts, you want to write music that you believe in, but also you want to write parts that you hope. That the musicians will want to engage. That there's something there about their part that says, "Yeah, it, it may be difficult. Uh, it may be almost impossible, but there's something there that I that I need to uh, need to address in order that I can expand my horizons as as a performer." And I think if you do that uh, earnestly, then musicians will, you know, definitely take on that challenge. Totally. Now, you're not always successful in that uh, endeavor, but I always think about that when I'm writing a piece. Is this something Michael will enjoy <laughs> learning? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm yet to know about that until we hear how it all goes, but I, I'm quite convinced that, uh, uh, that I might be on the right track here because I've had enough experience in working with musicians like Michael who um, have put their whole, their whole life uh, into their work and are identified through their, through their music. Now I'm, you know, I started music as a very young boy playing, studying the classical guitar. And, and I, when I think of those early days, um, I'm as excited today at the age 79 as I was when I was that eight year old kid studying the classical guitar. And so music has been a central part of my life and the opportunity to have yet another, uh, another piece for, for Michael and, and especially for this 100th anniversary is very special for me because of my long association with the school and my love for the school and all that it, it has provided for me and all the wonderful musicians that have come out of the school. Well, we're, we're so grateful to you, Joe, for the pieces you've written through Eastman Ensembles over the years and this latest piece uh, so we can't wait uh, to see you back in Rochester yeah, yeah look forward to it for sure you know I, I want to go back to that when you were talking about the sort of joy of writing for percussion and I was thinking about the fact that you have this virtually unlimited palette of sounds that you can write for so again you're all composers on the screen here and I'm wondering how you deal with this idea of we can do anything like you know is that freeing or is that um uh daunting well i uh, create your own boxes to say i'm going to try and contain it within this yeah. and explore yeah. that area the most yeah I, i'm going to jump in here um i think it's it's freeing if you're clear on what you're writing and why you're writing it. Um, I always, I feel like I, it's, it's hard for me to start a piece if I don't have a story, if I don't have a dramatic impetus to write something. And so once I have that, then I can, then I can say, okay, what are the sounds necessary to illustrate this, this dramatic, this this thing because for me music 
the music that I'm interested, the music that I want to write, the music that I want to hear, um, is music that tries to give the audience, the listener, an experience, you know. And I'm trying to give the listener uh, an illustration, a, a glimpse of, of what I'm thinking. So I might be thinking something, um, you know, bad or good or happy or sad or political or not political related to love related to relationships related to psychological things related to like the impressionists the outside world and looking at a landscape or something i whatever the story is i i'm trying to um illustrate that through with the music um and so the sound then it's easier to to pick what sounds would be appropriate uh for that um in my piece i, I titled it the inexorable motion of time you know i just started thinking about you know it's it's as i you know get older you start thinking about how and and you and events around you are happening you, you think about how time just doesn't wait it just doesn't move it does, you may want it to stop um each moment is like a present moment and then it's gone to the next present moment and so forth and so on and so i was kind of illustrating that uh trying to illustrate that with this constant um clave that that keeps happening throughout um and um you know and i found that the marimba with its very percussion percussive um you know short and stopped sound you know kind of gave you know a kind of a almost like a ticking of a clock type um feel to it um and so that that was an instance where you know what i was trying to say um determined what sounds that i would use what 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 um you know orchestration that i would use but i think it's it's for me it's you have to be really clear on what story you're trying to 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 say um in order to um orchestrate properly and use use the sounds appropriately great well you know, one of the things been fun about this too i can say from my perspective with both of you guys is um their willingness to like go in different directions like i remember you know uh, Joe and I have had several, even the initial conversations with Joe about what do you want me to write for kind of things? What are you interested in playing? What's the setup going to look like? Which is fun to say, well, let's, let's, you know, I don't want to play this instrument, so let's, let's leave that out. Well, how about this, you know? But, you know, uh, but even as the piece is written saying, you know, this is, this is going to be hard for me to do this and this at the same time, how we do this? Or how about if we just, I just sent him an email, like, I don't know, maybe three or four days ago, said, hey, you know, I got these big galvanized pipes what about me using these pipes instead of the triangles? You know, I mean, instead of triangles, you play pipes. And Jerome, I expect, oh my gosh, that's going to be, I like what Jerome is like, that's going to sound great and it's going to look great too or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, it's fun because you can experiment and say, hey, I'm doing this this way. What do you think? Bah, bah, bah. Um, and it's, it's just fun to work with people that are willing to, you know, just are, are interested in what you I mean, you want you want it to be a collaborative uh, process uh, between the composer and then and the performers. It seems to me, and you have to have a willingness to um, know whether or where the limitations are with these instruments. And since I'm not a percussionist, I didn't study with you. I didn't study with John Beck. There are points at which uh, my musical um, taste maybe exceed the bounds of my ability to understand <laughs> the technical uh, limitations of the instruments. And so therefore, it makes sense to uh, want to engage, <laughs> engage you and find out what, in fact, is, is, is possible. And so I, I learned a lot, actually, from our discussions and uh, from um, this kind of collaborative activity. And uh, I guess I won't make those mistakes again in the, in the future, hopefully. If, uh, well, no, but I mean, I think it's always too as a performer. I mean, you're always like, you don't want to, you don't, you don't want to tell a composer you can't do it. You know, gosh, I can find a way to make this happen. You know, always feel, you know. Um, so it's always a tenuous kind of moment to say, you know, I'm not sure I can actually do this. You know, you, always, you feel like you're whipping out somehow. You know, so. The the other thing about uh, about this is not only the premiere, which is the first time that these pieces appear uh, in public. But the, the question is, will these pieces have long enough legs to stand on their own and have a future? 
uh, as a part of an ongoing living repertoire. And one can never really know that uh, for sure. I mean, my percussion concerto um, that Chris Lamb premiered with the New York Philharmonic has over has had over 300 performances. I never believed that it would ever receive that kind of consideration over you know many years. Uh, so one never knows how people are going to take to the music, not only the performers, but obviously the audiences as well. But we can do the best that we can by engaging uh, as successfully as possible, the musicians that make the music. If we can't convince the musicians, then it's all, uh, it all bets are off at that point in time. So that's why I, I think about the musicians all the time, absolutely all the time while I'm working on a piece. Now you can't know every musician in an orchestra, but you may know the conductor maybe very well and know what he, he or she is likely to do. And that's your first entree into an understanding of how your music might work with that ensemble, for example. Well, I think both these pieces, and I mean this, I mean, I'm not just, I really believe both these pieces are gonna have long legs. I think uh, they're gonna, they're gonna uh, be played a lot. I really believe that too. They're gonna, you know, we're gonna do good videos and just think things of these pieces to help put them out there beyond the premiere. But um, I just think, you know, both, but both because of who you guys are as composers and musicians, but also because of the quality of the music and the, you know, the percussion world, we're looking, everyone in, in my field is hungry for, for new great pieces, especially for chamber. And I think chamber music is really where it's at right now too. People are, especially in the percussion field, people are, the students I get, most of them want to be chamber musicians. Um, and so, and, you know, at, at, at my level, at the, at the conservatory level, university, yeah. They're, they're eating up this kind of music and this stuff's going to be like going to be just a huge welcome new repertoire for us. You know, it's interesting during Mozart's time, new music was what was wanted is what the audience kind of craved the new pieces. We don't have that today, in the, at least in the orchestral world. It's the familiar well known kind of romantic classical romantic repertoire is what is a, seems to be appreciated by the by the audience. And so when you get to a new work, uh, their, their, their first uh, approach is very standoffish. But you can understand that unless you give the audience an opportunity to become familiar with these new works. You know. When I was first composer in residence with the St. Louis Symphony, when I finished my tenure uh, in St. Louis, that orchestra and that audience knew my music, my music better than any contemporary music. And so the un audience understood my musical voice and that can only be done through repetition, right? Uh, and uh, we wish and we hope that uh, new music will continue to find a place uh, in the concert world. And certainly we, we understand that that happens now with uh, in the percussion, mm -hmm. creating new repertoire, people looking forward in wind ensemble world as well, constantly looking for new pieces and providing support for composers to write new works for wind ensemble. You know, I started by saying that we've commissioned over 50 compositions for our centennial. And, and really, we've had a wonderful committee of students, faculty, and staff for three years have been planning the centennial. There's an element about it that is looking back, right? To celebrate right. those who have come before, the accomplishments, the building of the school to what it's become. But, yeah. but a big part, and I'd say the majority was trying to look forward. and. These commissions, we hope, will have just that legs that they will go into the world and take, you know, both the, the quality of the music, music that's been written, but the Eastman name and the legacy that these started here into the world and, and you know, have many, many performances going forward and not just the, the premieres of our school here. And um, we think that's perhaps the greatest contribution we can make as part of our centennial is to create new music. Well, you know, that, that really is a legacy of Howard Hansen. He was making recordings of the Eastman, of the Eastman uh, ensembles back in the 30s and 40s with, with recordings that no other school was doing in the country. So already back then, um, and in the 50s, obviously, uh, Eastman's name was being put forth in, in the public because of these recordings. Well, I'll tell you, it's been an exciting year for us because Virtually every ensemble has had a premiere by you know wonderful composers, and we have quite a few more in the next seven weeks, the last seven weeks of the semester. And Bravo. Um, 
it's, Bravo. I, 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 I know the students appreciate this right now, but I also think they're gonna look back on this year and realize truly what a remarkable time it was. And the students and the percussion ensemble are gonna say, I played on the concert when we premiered, you know, Joseph Schwantner's work and Billy Child's work. And, and hopefully again, 10, 15, 20 years from now, those will just be staples of the repertoire that everybody knows. And they'll know that they, they had a part of that history. And I, I, I'm excited for them, for that. Well, listen, we are um, coming to the end of our time here. I'm just so grateful, one, that, that you are part of this centennial with us and that um, you have composed these works and I can't wait to hear them. Um, it's been a real privilege for us to have with us um, Emeritus Professor Joseph Schwantner, uh, one of the great uh, jazz pianists and composers and, and more than just jazz, uh, such an eclectic musician, Billy Childs, and, um, and the Paul J. Burgett Distinguished Professor of Percussion, uh, Michael Burry. Thank you all for being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. As we, uh, as we close here, I just want to remind everybody that um, we hope you will join us tomorrow night, uh, March 24th at 7.30 p.m. for the Eastman Percussion Ensemble concert. It's going to feature Billy Child's new composition, The Inexorable, <laughs> Inexorable Motion of Time, I just stumbled on that. <laughs> and this is commissioned, we're so grateful to um, uh, Sridevi Pandya, who commissioned this in honor of uh, the late Dr. Tishna Padya, and Joseph Schwantner's Fast Forward, which was commissioned by the Howard Hansen Institute for American Music. And this is going to feature Michael um, as a soloist, along with the percussion ensemble. So you can attend in person at Eastman, or you can watch uh, online via the live stream. Just go to our uh, homepage and in the lower right hand corner, there's a, a link for the live stream. The third event in our Conversations with Composer series is going to feature Grammy Award winning composer and conducting Maria Schneider and uh, her collaboration with Eastman's new jazz ensemble. That conversation will take place on April 26th and the concert on April 27th, both of which will be 730. And the last of the series will take place on Sunday, May 1st, with um, composer John Clayton and um, Bill Dobbins, who has also been commissioned to write a work. I would also say this is going to be Bill Dobbins' final concert um, before he retires. So I hope you'll all join us to help celebrate his incredible legacy at Eastman. So to all of you, thanks so much for joining us. To uh, Joe and Billy and Michael, thanks so much for your time. And we can't wait for the concert tomorrow night.